All right, and uh, and let me introduce let me introduce our speaker today to everyone. Even though Hilary Joy Virtanen is known to uh, a lot of people in the Finnish American circles, so I'll I'll still do the formal introduction. Hilary Joy Virtanen is assistant professor of Finnish and Nordic studies at Finlandia University, where she teaches teaches in and directs the minor granting program. A native of Toivola, Michigan. Virtanen holds a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in Scandinavian folklore. Her research interests include holidays and festivals, folk music, leftist folklore, and ethnic stereotypes. She is part of the editorial staff of the Journal of Finnish Studies and a member of the Board of Trustees of the Finlandia Foundation National. She lives at the parsonage of Grace Lutheran Church, a former Suomi Synod Church in South Range, Michigan, with her family. And, uh, and her talk today is about fin Finnish, Finnish America and the, and the folklore and the traditions in Finnish America. So welcome, Dr. Virtanen. Great, I'll give you the floor. <laughs> thank you. And thanks to everybody for coming. Um, this is super exciting. This has been a month full of thinking about Finnish and Finnish American culture for me. And so I'm glad to get a chance to do this. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give just what I hope to be a rather short lecture. People know I can talk until you tell me to stop or walk away. But um, I wanna have this where it's kind of short and then we can actually use what I say as a springboard for discussing the things that we think of as Finnish and Finnish American traditions. And so um, I, I'll just give us a little bit of a framework to do that and then we can jump off. And there's pictures and stuff as well. So let me just share my screen here really quick. And then put it on the slideshow when this little button thing comes out of the way. There we go. Okay, so the first thing I'll say is that, um, you know, when we have FinFest, like FinFests actually are a tradition that has been established within the Finnish American community since the you know early 80s, since 1983. And so when we have a FinFest together, it's a tradition actually that we have navigated and negotiated over time. And it becomes something that has expected sets of things that will happen. We know that there'll be like lectures. We know that there'll be music and dancing. We know there'll be the Tori where you can go and pick up a bunch of great things to buy. And so this in itself, even though it's very new and very modern, is very much a Finnish American tradition. And so I'm happy that even though COVID has kept us all apart, we're able to maintain this tradition in some way and to continue to celebrate our Finnishness. So that's a good feat in itself. You know, one of these times we'll be back together and we'll be like, hey, remember that time we had to have this online and we didn't get to be together? So cherish the fact that, that we can do this and that we have been doing it for a while. When I think about, I wanna go ahead and talk about a couple of different things because a couple of different words to define. Because when we talk about Finnish Americans and we talk about Finns and we talk about Americans, we're looking at these ideas of culture, ideas of ethnicity and ideas of tradition. And so I wanna just kind of break that down just a tiny bit. And so when I teach my students what the word culture entails and what it encompasses, I like to say that it's learned behavior and practices that develop through and largely serve to maintain social connections to others. So when I describe it to these students, I say that culture is what different humans use to respond to their common needs. And so a lot of us, when we were in grade school, we learned about the three basic needs we had, right? Food, shelter, and clothing. I would also say that we have this very important social set of needs as well, which includes things like friendship, family, love, um, competitiveness and sports, like what have you, right? So there's these kind of four basic needs that we really have. And culture is, human cultures across the world are how it is that, that we respond to these needs. And so when you think about it that way, you can think about very basic things and how it is that people, how it is that cultures can create these responses to them and why it is that they create these responses. And also how it is that these responses to our needs that we create as a group can change over time. And I'll show you some examples here in a few minutes. The idea of ethnicity, if you think of ethnicity as kind of like a subset of culture, um, the anthropologist Thomas Hilland Erickson gives this good definition when he says that ethnicity simply refers to aspects of relationships between groups which consider themselves and are regretted by others as being culturally distinctive. And so, you know, I think that this concept isn't terribly 
unknown to Americans because a lot of us have these different backgrounds. You know, some of us have an indigenous ethnic background. Some of us have ethnic backgrounds from other places in the world. And so we can kind of consider that as a part of our own identity and recognize parts of it. So it includes things like um, practices that we share. It includes our language. It includes sometimes religious traditions. It includes um, food preparation traditions, holidays, and all kinds of things. And so, um, you know, culture, again, is this kind of set of responses to our needs. And ethnicity is a part of the grouping of cultures to kind of make these things happen. So, you know, people can belong to more than one ethnicity as well as a lot of us Americans know, right? And then, so the next phrase that I want to kind of, or the next word I want to just conceptualize before we go forth would be tradition. And so tradition is often conceived as these kind of age old practices that can be frozen and just passed on from generation to generation. And so a lot of times when we think about traditional things, we just kind of, it's always been like that. It's always been there. You know, if it disappeared from our life, it would be very strange or, but, but it's seen as kind of frozen a lot of times, but it carries on through this constant process of renewal and reimagination. And it's through this process that cultures worldwide continue to survive and adapt to social change. So the folklorist Henry Glassy says that tradition is the creation of the future out of the past. And that's a pretty good kind of basic thing to think about because it allows for tradition to be dynamic. It allows for us to think of tradition as things that we actually have effects on. And it, but traditions give us this cultural framework out of which to meet our needs and to imbue meaning in much of what we do through engagement with and reshaping of practices that our ancestors and other predecessors have created. Traditions survive and adapt when they're beneficial to the group and they die out and disappear when a group no longer needs them. New traditions develop over time as groups create new cultural practices. And this fact is really important to understanding Finnish American culture. It understands us, to, it allows us to understand how from this festival first celebrated in 1983, we're now taking part in a tradition that we constantly navigate and negotiate over time. So if we go back to that idea of needs and how a culture can respond to them, I've got these four pictures that demonstrate this. So up here, we've got a picture of some food. If anybody has had a korva pusti lately, you know that they're excellent, you know, little kind of sweet buns. Um, I'm wearing a Finnish national costume from Lapua down in the lower part. Shelter, I'll explain that I do not believe that saunas are a shelter typically, but in a lot of Finnish American homes, um, the idea of not having a sauna is kind of, oh gosh, that's terrible. Like what would we do with that? And so, you know, this is a culturalized response to what are considered a broader part of shelter related needs. And then there's social needs. So up in the upper left-hand corner, we have members of Laulu Aika from the Twin Cities performing at a Yuhanus festival in Toivola, Michigan. So, so all of these needs are responded to through the cultural triggers that we have, right? And if we belonged to different cultures, we might be eating different things. If, you know, we were in France, this food might be, you know, a chocolate bun or some, you know, a brioche, something like that. Um, be wearing vastly different clothing, wearing kind of chic, fancy clothing. There would not be a sauna in the home or right next to the home at all. And the musical practices and festival practices would be quite different. So you can kind of overlay different examples from all kinds of different cultures and see that this is kind of a consistent idea that I'm trying to put here. So when we think about, you know, I mean, this, these are pictures of us doing these things now. Um, and I should also just kind of say that with regard to clothing traditions in Finnish America, a lot of times you'll see it in t-shirts like Baja Boiga or FinFest 2013 or whatever, you know, you've got these things that mark you as being Finnish. Sisu, very popular t-shirt. Um, and so this is, you know, when you put on like a Kansali's puku, it's kind of this higher level. Like I don't have one because I can't afford it, but it was fun to try on. And it represents Finnishness that people can all kind of see and understand on a Finnish and an American level. So when the early immigrants came back starting in the 1800s, um, you know, they came over with these practices and these, these traditions that they had that, that when they got here and they went and settled in different places, they needed to adapt a little bit over time. And so you can see here on the left, we have these siblings. They were the Mackinans who lived in um, Mass City in the early 1900s. And they're wearing folk dress that's very reminiscent of um, Kansali Spuku. It's not fully kind of solidified as a formal model of it, but they're dressing for a picture in a way that represents them as being Finnish immigrants. And the person who gave me this photo said that, you know, this was meant to kind of represent them looking stylish and being able to kind of send it and be like, we're still Finns, we're in America. Um, but this is their dress response. They were used to wearing certain clothes. And when they came over here, they kept those certain clothes. 
they had traditional festivals and stuff that they celebrated. So in Teufela, you know, the Yuhonus has been going on basically since people got there. It's only been canceled a few times and one of those times is due to COVID. But the, if you look at different descriptions of the festival over the years, you can see that there's these very stable things that are done. And then every once in a while, they'll put new activities, different you know, music groups or different, um, different venues, different um, ways of serving food and stuff like that for the group. So, so this tradition comes over here and it sets itself on the American landscape. And then sometimes it can kind of stay stable depending on what's going on. And sometimes it has to change a little bit due to what is available, the resources, the social resources, and actual physical resources of being able to enact being Finnishness. Um, up in the corner up here, we've got, these are my great grandparents actually, you can see they were pretty successful hunting that year. And uh, it looks like my great grandma Helmi was kind of a fiery lady. I, I don't know where I get that from. But um, you know they have these food waste traditions that they brought over from Finland that in the upper peninsula, at least, it was pretty easy to just take the Finnish traditions and kind of keep rolling with them because similar landscape and stuff like that. And then at the bottom, we have the building tradition. So this is a picture of a barn at a Hanka Homestead Farm out, up, also up in the upper peninsula. So when they come over here, again, they have these things that they do. Sometimes they're gonna have to vastly change them. Like if these folks move to a place like a city, right? And they're from rural parts of Finland, they're gonna immediately have to adapt to very, very dramatically to what it is that they can do and how it is that they can practice culture. But different Finnish American communities essentially over time inherit these kind of practices from their ancestors and then they have to adapt them. Sometimes they keep these practices, sometimes they completely disappear. Um, and the, the immigrants themselves, they're gonna do things again, like creating transitional languages like Finglish, creating different forms of building things because certain resources weren't available. Certain types of wood might not be available in parts where Finns settled and such. Certain festivals weren't considered useful anymore. So, you know, these things are all a part of this experience of being Finnish American and navigating a new culture for ourselves. Another aspect of Finnish American culture then is this idea of inter-ethnicity. And so this is where people um, from different cultures, they come together, you know, they come together in the workplace, they come together in their neighborhoods and in the schools, and they start over time to share the things that they do and to adapt different things from other people. And so one of the more famous examples I would say in Finnish America is, you know, if any of you ever go on the different Finnish American Facebook groups, a lot of times people will be talking about pasty recipes and stuff. I love pasties. They're one of my favorite foods on earth and, you know, Anytime somebody wants to ask me, hey, you want a pasty? The answer is always going to be yes, even if I just got done eating one or two. Um, <laughs> always room for more. But one of the interesting things about pasties is that some people realize and some people don't is that the pasty as we understand it actually comes from Cornwall, England. And, and it was brought over um, by fellow miners from Cornwall who went into places like the Upper Peninsula, Minnesota, and Wisconsin and met their, their neighbors, the Finns, and, you know, hey, you've got this food pocket we're eating for lunch that's very convenient and very tasty. So, you know, I mean, Finnish Americans have adapted the pasty in their own way with slightly different ingredients and stuff like that, um, such that Finnish Americans a lot of times consider pasties to be a Finnish ethnic tradition, and that's, that's totally fine. It's a kind of inter-ethnic thing that has happened, you know, people having access to other things. One of the interesting inter-ethnic developments that established itself up in the Upper Peninsula is actually a sauna beer being brewed by the Bosch Brewing Company <clears throat> in Hancock, Michigan. And so you can see that you know, a company, a corporation, it's not a terribly large corporation, but a, a corporate entity sees that, hey, we could actually market something called sauna beer. Like I can't imagine, you know, Budweiser coming out with something like this. Like this is something a local brewery did in response to local perceived needs of food practices, right? So it's an interesting thing. I should also mention, I didn't get a picture of it because I could only find grainy pictures and didn't have time to run to the store yesterday, but um, there is actually also sauna makara, which is sold by a local sausage company, Volworths. So again, a company with a German last name has this interaction with the local Finnish immigrant population and says, you know, we could actually market to this. Like we can be a part of a food ways that they have. So the interesting connections are big. Another area that you see it in, of course, is the fin Finglish language. And so when Finns come over here and they're speaking exclusively Finnish, over time, they start kind of adapting in English words, English phrasing, and still using different conventions of Finnish constructions and such to, to create this really interesting transitional language that looks nothing like Finnish sometimes, and also nothing like English. So these are all kind of this aspect of inter-ethnicity. It's where you basically take 
things. You borrow from each other, you try out different ways of doing things that match with your own culture and kind of make it acceptable to your own group. And this, this is also something that happens in a lot of groups worldwide. And then there's these very stable traditions that came over here. And um, even though they can be endangered if young people aren't practicing them and if there isn't another generation to take them on, a lot of times people will see the practices that people do and think, you know, this looks very much like what you see in Finland. And so on the left, we have Pekka Olsen. Um, a couple of years ago, I went out and interviewed him with Michael Lokonen for this film. And Pekka is a woodworker. And a lot of the things that he does are different types of woodworking that you see in Finland that are very traditional. And he's actually gotten to study with master carvers in Finland and such. And um, so he took us out into the woods and showed us how he kind of listens to the forest and pays attention to what's going on in the forest before selecting the types of woods right there that he can use for his craft. And so this is very kind of stable. It's very traditional. It's got very old kind of roots and it's something that he learned from the people before him and that he's now showing us how to do and at the same time showing apprentices he had. In the middle, we've got the Yuhonus bonfire in Toivola. A lot of times, um, it's almost kind of like a tourist attraction, I would say, for Finnish nationals to come to our Yuhonus because it's, it's, I guess it's very Finnish, you know. Um, and it again has this kind of stability, like people just expect that it'll always be there. And sometimes it can be endangered. It was endangered by COVID, of course. Sometimes it could be endangered by rainstorms. And other times, you know, the, the idea that maybe young people aren't going to come together and build the Coco in the future and aren't going to come together and do the institutional things that need to be done to make it happen is a threat. But as a, as a tradition right now, it stays very stable. It's something that's very recognizable. It's something that has really, really clear ties to the previous ways that it's been celebrated in Toivola. And it's something that everybody considers, you know, this hallmark of community practice. And on the right, we have Lori Oikarainen, who's a um, rag rug weaver and also a rag rug um, uh, crocheter, I guess is the word for that. And so we went and visited her one time and she showed us her loom and her weavings and stuff. And so this too is something that is considered very Finnish American. Um, weaving is still among some people a very popular tradition in Finland. And in Finland, they even have like next to lakes, these special areas where you can wash your rag rugs, like these kind of cool docks with certain places to put them up and stuff. And so this is a tradition that has come over here and has been able to maintain kind of a sense of stability. There's a really, really wonderful book about rag rug weaving by the folklorist Yvonne Lockwood um, that, that tells a lot about this and shows, you know, Lori's one of the people featured in it. But so essentially, you know, we have these stable traditions again that, that are very, very recognizable from the things that were brought over directly from Finland from the ancestors, so. And then the next kind of category we have are the things that Rome, that, that show this kind of shift from being Finnish to being Finnish American in nature. And so on the left, we have Pekka Olsen with me and we went to his house. I've, I've visited with Pekka so much that, um, gosh, I mean, I've got hours and hours of conversations with him, but we went to visit him one winter because it was burbot fishing season and some burbot had been caught and we brought some caught ones over to his house. Burbot is this fish that it's called Made in Finnish and, um, they're very distinctive because they spawn in January, which, you know, is a very, very weird time of year for that. And so you catch them under ice and then their roe is extremely good and their flesh is delicious. It's very mild. Even the liver is mild. So if you ever get to try it, I suggest it. But we went over to Pekka's house with some freshly caught mare and he had agreed to make a kalakukko for us. So kalakukko, of course, is this Finnish traditional delicacy from the province of Savo. It typically has this rye crust and, you know, onions and uh, fish and potatoes, I think. But Pekka made his slightly differently because of the resources he had and also the taste that he liked. And so he explained as he made these pies that when he was younger, they would use whatever flour they had around. And so, you know, if they had some wheat flour, if they had some rye flour, they would throw it in whatever. Um, because he was surprised, we were all surprised at how early the fish came in that year. And so the only crust, the only thing he had on hand to make a crust at that moment was um, pie crusts like you can buy in the store, but he made it, it was delicious, it was wonderful. So, so he takes this tradition that he's grown up with and this traditional word that he's grown up with and adjusts it to the things that he has available at the time and the needs that we all had to get that pie made in order to make a film, right? So in the middle picture, we have uh, Joseph Kullinen displaying a personalized St. Urho license plate from the 1980s. And so St. Urho and St. Urho's day, of course, are very, very much just Finnish American. So this is one of those traditions that we have now that only was established in 1956 that we can look at and say that is not something from Finland and it doesn't actually directly reflect anything about Finland. And so sometimes, you know, people will look at that and be like, well, that's fake and that's, you know, it's silly. It's why are they doing that? It's 
because we have a different experience here in the United States and because we need to create things sometimes that may seem fake and silly in order to keep our culture going in ways that are acceptable just to us. And so, of course, you know, people typically know that St. Urho's Day is celebrated the day before St. Patrick's Day in a nod to the Iron Range um, Minnesota Irish people who were teasing the Finns for not having their own fun, cool things to celebrate. Ours is so fun and cool, it takes place the day before yours, and he was a really great guy. So, you know, of course, for those who don't know, St. Urho, they, they invented this kind of story where he um, chased the giant, you know, kind of like dog-sized grasshoppers out of Finland in order to protect the legendary Finnish grape crop, which... I mean, if you're a wine connoisseur, you know all the best wines come from Finland. Like that's, you think Finland, you think wine. So, you know, they just kind of create this fun thing. They have things associated with it, like wearing the colors purple and green. And there's this festival culture that's developed where there's parades, people have dances, people have whatever it is that that community wants for that. So the St. Urho tradition actually is really great because it's something that was created on Finnish Americans own terms. And it's something that we have say over and that we can do without feeling like we're violating or changing something from Finland and that we're being too untraditional to Finland. We're being traditional to Finnish America, which is who we are now, right? And then on the right, we have um, another invented tradition is the, the Haking Baba Festival here in Hancock, Michigan. And so we have John and Pauline Kiltonen who have just been crowned the Hancocky Hakey honorees. And so like a lot of American festivals, there's this kind of time where people will honor somebody. Sometimes there'll be a crowning, right? Like if you have your county fair, there's the county fair queen. If you have, um, you know, different things like that, you always want to kind of honor somebody in some way. And so at the Haking Piva Festival, it's no different. And it's done under this very interesting Finnish American terms where, you know, the festival itself was established to celebrate the idea of these kind of midwinter proverbs that exist, that continue to exist among Finnish Americans in this local region up here. And it expanded into this kind of gosh, you, winter could be pretty brutal up here in the Upper Peninsula. We need something just fun to do right now, right here, that can get us through this midwinter blues stretch. And that references very distant things about Finnish culture, farming proverbs that people don't really say every more, anymore in the everyday. Um, the legends of this, this Finnish you know, patron saint, Saint, saint he Henrik, who um, died in the 1100s and who isn't really celebrated in Finland anymore. He was a Catholic priest, right? You know, Finland is now <laughs> Lutheran. And it also ties to just the things that, that we here in America do on our own. So things like having a Hancocky Hakey, the Hakey of Hancock, you know, it's that's not from Finland, that's from here. So we've got this kind of cultural tradition that sort of expands as people need them. So, Again, there's this kind of reconfiguration of traditions to reflect available things and the needs right then. There's this creation of entirely Finnish American traditions that don't reflect Finland at all. And then this creation of entirely Finnish American tradition that has faint nods to Finland. So these, these are all kind of hopefully, hopefully, and hopefully as you're listening to this, you're all thinking of things like, oh, I can think of examples of that because that's what you can use to discuss. And then the last thing that I'll mention is this idea of Finnish reconnections. And so even though there's this core group of immigrants that we know comes between about 1880 and 1920, and then it really kind of fizzles out after that, there are still Finns today who move to the United States. I'm, I'm looking at one right now on my screen, right? Um, and so, so it, there is conti continued direct contact with Finland through newer Finnish immigrants. There's also, you know, the internet, right? Like we have ways that we can connect with each other that people didn't have back in 1920. Um, there's genealogy and DNA, right? Like tons of people are getting their DNA tested and then they're actually connecting with people across the pond and making that connection and then maybe visiting with them at some point. So travel, the internet, commerce, and continued immigration to the United States in smaller numbers, make sure that we continue to have these kind of bursts of Finnish culture and ideas of Finnishness coming into America and kind of re-livening things. So one of the ways that you can see this is through, um, again, international commerce. A tiny example of international commerce would be this. I have a picture of the Tori from Haking Paiva here in um, Hancock a couple years ago. And so they always have a market where you can buy things that are either kind of uh, Northwoods themed or Finnish in nature. And if you look closely, you can see a couple of splashes of like Marimekko fabric looking down on this picture of the Tori. There's also foods available there that are Finnish, like Lox Loda, which I love. And then on the right-hand side, we see Pasi Somero, Oren Tikkanen, and um, Vai Wietela. They're at a jam session at the Yuhanos. And so Pasi Somero was this Finn who came over here. He, he still is a Finn, he's still around. Um, but he came over here as an intern and he got so 
enamored of the Finnish American culture that, that he could see. Um, he actually wrote about it for his master's thesis. And he went to Johannes and jammed with Oren and they practiced these kind of old traditional Finnish American songs. And so he, people from Finland will actually come over here to see the, the culture that we have and to kind of interact with it because it is an older thing. It is something that doesn't fully survive in Finland. So, so again, these are just kind of the points of uh, Con the points of ideas that I want to have so that we can talk about these things. So really quick, I'll just walk through the slides again. So this idea of cultural needs being met, early immigrant culture bringing us the, the raw materials that we have for creating Finnishness, but then being adjusted with things like inter-ethnic borrowings and people borrowing ideas from us, stable traditions that are maintained from the immigrants and can sometimes adjust here and there to different American needs and American conventions of things, but remain very recognizable to Finnish eyes today. And then the shift of practices from being very, very recognizably fully Finnish to being somewhere in between to being completely Finnish American. And then reconnecting with Finland over time. So as long as we continue to have dialogues across the ponds, as long as people have different types of Finnishness that they share with one another, we'll always have these different new traditions and these different kind of realignment of traditions going on in Finnish American culture. So that is all I have for that. And so I'll just kind of answer, or I'll ask, why do we keep and recreate the tr traditions that we do? And I'll go ahead and um, maybe stop screen sharing and we can start to talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Virpan, and this was fascinating. And now if you have, if the audience, if you have any questions here, you can uh, go to the chat here at the bottom of the of your screen and just type your message there at the chat screen. I, um, I am just, you know, fascinated. This is wonderful. Of course, I've known a lot of these Finnish American traditions and uh, just getting this information in just one package today is is just fascinating. So uh, we have uh, Liz, uh, Lisa Lambert pointing out that her grandfather came from Finland and had always been a dowser and so he kept on doing it and this is this is what we remember of our our um, grandparents uh, and the tra traditions they they brought. Mm. So, uh, Geo is sending greetings from the sauna. <laughs> <laughs> and he's uh, got a laptop with Sisu. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we have a question Can you comment about religious traditions? Um, yeah, I could, right? And so, one of the just like all practices that we have, you know, Finns came over with the traditions that they had, and then they had to kind of overlay them on the American landscape. And so, you know, a lot of people in Finland, they have a state church, the, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland. And then there were also the, um, the Listadian movements that are primarily in kind of like the north and west of Finland. And, you know, Listadianism within Finland has a direct relationship, from what I understand, with the, the mainstream, the state church. But when people came over here, one of the interesting things, of course, is that in America, we have full religious freedom and that you could, you know, if you want to found a church, you just can. And so this allowed for different religious expressions to have freedom to develop and to change here in the United States. And so, you know, with regards to the state Finnish church, the interesting thing that kind of happens over time is first they founded something called the Swami Synod and Finlandia University or Swami College where I work is, you know, it was considered like the seminary for that for quite a while. Um, and so the Sumi Synod exists until 1962, and it maintains this very kind of direct relationship or kind of direct correlation, I would say, to the Finnish state church. And I mean, I, I guess there are people probably maybe like Jonathan Runman, if he's around, he could comment better on this. Um, but but um, when, when the church, after 1962, when it becomes the Sumi Conference, they join the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, which is kind of a bunch of the Nordic Lutheran churches banding together because they realize that they, they have to in order to survive. And so this causes a shift, right? So does the shift in language. So there was a time when you would do the sermons and the, the hymns all in Finnish. And over time that changes as the immigrant population changes and as the nature of how you're gonna be religious. So I don't know if that kind of helps answer the question, but yeah, it, it, anytime that you come to America with these different things, I would say that there probably are aspects of the church here, the ELCA church here that, you know, in a mainstream or a mostly Finnish 
congregation is quite different from some of the things that they would do in Finland and also with the Listadians as well. So. Okay, thanks. And uh, I'm going to address this one question um, about future FinFests and, and uh, these virtual events. Uh, if you go to the FinFest uh, page, FinFest USA page, you will find, uh, find recordings of the past events and you will find the, the list of the forthcoming events. Next month, it, it's going to be a music event by Liz Jakola. And then uh, on May, it's going to be Thomas Hovi from University of uh, University of Turku uh, Migration Institute there, and he will be talking about the Kalevala. Okay, more questions. So uh, Judith has a comment. My mother made a soup dish called Moyakka, yet my Finnish cousins didn't know what that was. Okay, so I have an answer for that. Um, so Moyakka is. I know, I know you will. <laughs> Moyaka is this, you know, this very kind of popular Finnish American word for stews. So you could have like a kala moyaka, for instance, a fish stew, or you could have a, um, sometimes it'll just be like a beef stew. And so they, it's, it's interesting because that word is extremely known among Finnish Americans, but not so much in Finland. Um, I have a friend who a couple of years ago discovered this old book, or not really an old book, but this kind of document about Finnish regional dialects. And as it turns out, the word Moyaka does come from an area in Ostrobothnia and kind of Western Finland, which coincidentally is also where a lot of the immigrants came from. And so it appears that Moyaka was just this dialect word that was used in a very narrow area, but for whatever reason, it really caught fire and caught on here in the United States. So, you know, there's Finland before the language really standardized and actually Helena can kind of probably describe this better. There were a lot of dialects, you know, before things like mass communication and television radio. Um, so you could have like these very narrow types of words that only existed in small areas and then other places would have different words for it. But yeah, so that's that's the mystery of Mayaka. That's that's great. Thank you for a good question, Judith. And uh, Dan is uh, writing, Sisu aside, is there a recognizable personality trait that can be traced to Finland? It would be interesting to see how I how it might be Americanized. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I mean, you know, I, I think that that can fall into as like thinking about the Finnish people, you know, and thinking, you know, I mean, I think quietness is kind of a stereotype of Finns, right? Like we can all kind of put put personality traits into these kind of culturalized ideas of how to behave, right? Like we learn from each other. And so that's how you get personality traits in the first place. Um, I guess apart from that, like I haven't I can't really think of anything off the top of my head just because people are really so different. Do, do you have any thoughts, Helena? I, uh, I was just thinking that it would be a really interesting thing to ask people, uh, write just one adjective about how you would describe. I wonder if we could do a poll, like that would actually be pretty cool. Yes, that would be cool. Uh, can you do it from your end? I might be able to. Um, so yeah, if I can do a poll, I will set one up and people can throw a word in there and we'll see what yes. we get. Um, but okay. actually, I, I don't see a poll option here, so they might not have it for the webinar. All right, it, it may may not be, but it's that would be something we could we could think about for the future. Just a, a discussion about what is what is finished. Uh, my adjective would be stubborn. <laughs> would that work? <laughs> So uh, it's interesting that old folk music has taken root in the U.S., but maybe less than stable back in Finland. Did I understand that correctly? This is Mary asking. So um, I would say that actually folk music in Finland is very well off. Um, if you ever get to meet people f who go to the Sibelius Academy, for instance, they have an entire department just dedicated to folk music. There's the Kaustin and Folk Festival in Western Finland. And so I would, and then there's folk bands that actually are very kind of modern and very popular. And so I would say that it's not necessarily that, that it's kind of not as stable in Finland, but that it changes in Finland in different ways from how the music changes here. Because in Finland, they have this kind of broader understanding, I would say, of what folk music can be based on just the the ways that folk music and art music interact and the ways that there, people don't really treat them as being separate things. But we have this kind of, 
I would say sometimes almost like a fixed repertoire. Like a lot of times with Finnish America, you can hear songs and know exactly where they come from. Um, you know, you've heard different kind of like shadishes or polkas and stuff like that. Um, but in Finland, I, I guess, you know, I mean, and people can debate this. There'll be a whole lecture about it later in this series, I'm sure. But um, you can kind of see that we have these things that came from our ancestors, right? Like we brought these songs over and they're very kind of important to us. And then just in the years immediately after that, but we haven't had the developments in folk music that they've had in Finland. And so we approach it very differently. And we also have been a part of an American culture that has its own folk music that we also engage with. Great. And, um, and if you are interested in this, we have that every other, every other Saturday, every, every other, not every other Saturday, every other month on the last Saturday, we have the music series going on. So uh, Liz Jakola is the next one. I think I mentioned that earlier. Yeah. So keep repeating so that people, people continue to uh, participate. This is fascinating. We have right now, we have over 200 participants. Oh so. boy, you guys are making me nervous. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully so, they're all cousins um I, I noticed that we skipped over ramona's question so i just wanted to ask we did, that. We did yes so you you see it there so you can address yeah, that so do our traditions follow from any particular parts of finland um yeah yeah a lot of them do uh, one example i can give that solid is it, it's it's really interesting but um nowadays the the midsummer bonfire in toivola is this giant coco you know it's this kind of big construction sort of um like tent shaped of wood that you set on fire um, but there's different forms of kokos that exist in Finland. And one of them comes from um, by the Kralian Isthmus. It was traditionally found over there. And it's basically this tall structure where you take poles, like really tall poles, and kind of put them up. And then you stack logs sort of to kind of create this tall and very narrow pyramid. It sort of looks like the um, that famous skyscraper in San Francisco, I would say, is kind of the shape of it. And and then you burn it that way. So it's called a um, sari koko is the name of it. And, you know, it could, again, it could be like 20 or 30 feet tall but it's very narrow the way it works. So, I mean, it must fall over dramatically. It must have these different things. Um, in Toivola back in the 1940s, somebody built a Sarri Coco one year and it also sort of resembled a, um, like an Olandic midsummer pole, but it had tires involved in it. So there were burning tires, you know, it was kind of something people did in the 1940s. So, so that comes from Eastern Finland. So you can see that somebody in Toivola had those roots. And I mean, I know some of the people from the community did come from that area. Um, so that's just one example. But of course, the example of Moyaka, you know, this word coming from Ostrobothnia. Um, there's different other word traditions that come, for instance, from the Finnish-Swedish border. So yeah, there's there's definitely regionalism that you can see in Finnish-American traditions. Okay, Paulette is asking uh, to have a recap of, uh, do, you, do we know who actually came up with the Saint Urho idea? Is, is that, can that be traced back? You mentioned the 1950s. But. Yeah, so there's two origin stories. Um, and actually, if you get a chance, the Finnish American Cultural Activities in Minneapolis did a discussion about Saint Urho, um, maybe like, you know, like a week and a half ago or so. And that's on their YouTube channel. So you could definitely hear straight from straight from Minnesotans themselves. But essentially, um, there was a man named Richard Matson who worked at a department store in Virginia, Minnesota. And there was a man named Sulo Habumaki who worked at um, Bemidji State in Bemidji, Minnesota. And they each kind of came up with this idea at the same time. So, you know, not being there and not having kind of a dog in the fight, I'm not really sure who is considered more legit. But essentially, um, Richard Matson put forth that St. Urho chased frogs out of Finland to protect the grapes. And um, so Havamaki said that they were grasshoppers that did the same thing. So the world may never know, maybe it's hidden in an archive somewhere in a little letter or whatever, but, but you know, it is an interesting thing because I think having multiple origin stories makes it catch on. That's great. Um, yes, uh, typical of folklore that how did it really how did this originate and this is not that long ago but we still don't necessarily know the exact answer to this very specific question uh, elizabeth is asking do people really say lax um for the salmon casserole yeah yeah and i mean sometimes you'll see it spelled l-a-k-s-l-o-o-d-a like using Finnish, you know, phonetics, at least here in Hancock. Um, so yeah, I've, I've heard it like that. Like, I guess you could say something like um, Lohi Lothiko or something like that. But but yeah, I've always heard it as Lox Lora. And so there's, especially around that border between Finland and Sweden, there's this language known as um, Meagili, our language. 
And so it's a dialect that is very much constructed. It's got Finnish construction, but it's got Swedish influence. And so I've taught community Finnish classes here in Hancock. And every once in a while, I'll actually find a Swedish word that's been Finnicized and brought over you know, by people's ancestors. And so one example I can give is that we had um, a, a unit on food and on you know, utensils and stuff. And so the word for fork in Finnish came up and a student kind of got this very crestfallen look on her face and she said, but my grandfather always said it was goffeli. And that comes from the Swedish word goffel, you know? And so, so I kind of said, no, your grandfather was right. Like that, that's okay to have a dialect word that's based off of Swedish. It's actually super cool. So there is that mixing. And I mean, they're very different language families. So it's kind of funny to think that you could take Swedish stuff from, you know, an Indo-European language and mash it up with Finno-Ugric, but you can't. And a lot of the Finnish immigrants, uh, actually most, came from Ostrobothnia, where you, where the, they were close to the Swedish-speaking areas. And in the Ostrobothnian dialects, you have plenty of borrowing from Swedish for that particular reason. Like, you know, my mother came from Ostrobothnia from, from a totally monolingual Finnish home, but uh, she always said hantuki, which is the kitchen towel. So uh, those kinds of words were, you know, languages get affected by close by languages. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Helia is saying, thank you for reminding us about the fact that there are still many kinds of Finnishness that exist depending, or depending on uh, where we are from and how our roots are affecting us daily. And that is so very true. Fern Malila is uh, writing, there are frequent discussions on social media sites regarding differing traditions between Finland and the US. In some cases, people have very strong opinions on whether some of these things that have been adapted uh, are real or really Finnish. How would you respond? <laughs> Well, the first thing I would say is that if they're being done, then they're real because they're happening, right? So, so that's one thing. But then the second thing is that Finns and Americans have 120 years between us from the earliest immigrants, right? Or like 140 years even. Um, and so there are these, we are very, very different people from each other in many ways. And so the things that we do to create a culture and to respond to the surroundings around us and our needs are going to end up being very different from Finland. And so there's there are wrong ways to do things, right? Like there are some things that you do culturally that, that could be considered quite wrong. Um, maybe putting um, samyaki in a kalamoyaka would be considered terrible, you know? <laughs> the, but, but essentially if we're doing it and it's not actually like harmful and it's something that meets our needs, it's not the finishness that should matter. It's the kind of satisfaction and the fact that we're continuing on in a way. And, you know, I mean, if I create something and I think this is me being Finnish American, the way that you find out if it's me being Finnish American is if other Finnish Americans take it on, right? Like, or if it's, if it's something that can take part in the broader culture. And so something like St. Urho, he really takes off because he responded to the needs that Finnish Americans had at that point for this kind of like social connection and the social identity that was divorced from being fully Finnish. So, you know, I mean, it's real if it happened and it might not be really Finnish some ways, but I don't think that really matters as long as it helps us meet our needs and continue community. Great. Uh, Vanessa is writing, my Finnish great-grandparents went from Michi uh, Finland to Michigan to Colorado to California as minors. Are there any good books on the migration on Finnish minors? Let me, uh, before, before you address this, uh, we will be posting on the FinFest USA site a resources link, um, which which might include uh, things that you know participants are interested in reading more about, and uh, I can't think of there. There is a book uh, about miners. Uh, I forget the name. Do you remember? Well, let me look at my shelf behind me. Yeah, there's there are a number of good books. Um, yeah, Finnish American history has had really been blessed by having people in both Finland and America to record it and to document it and write about it. And so, I mean. You know, there's there's general history books like Finns in the United States, which just came out in 2014, so it's you know more recent. But then there's older works like, um, let's see, oh goodness, where's the one? I'm trying to sorry, I'm trying to think here because Finlandia Foundation National published a book which has minors on the title Minors. Yeah, and that ties in Miners Boots is the institutional yeah. history of yeah. the Finlandia Foundation itself, so it's not about minors. Um, 
but but yeah, we'll actually. I guess we should just address that question by showing the list because there are a lot of books and I can put in some specific minor related materials in my list before I hand it over to, to Helena. So look uh, for the resources link on the FinFest USA page. Um, Jonathan is writing, Finland was just ranked the happiest country in the world for the fourth time in a row. What are your thoughts about this? And do you think this extends to Finnish Americans? <laughs> so I, I have a friend in Finland who was thinking about doing a film about this, one of the first times that Finland received this accolade. Um, I would say that it doesn't necessarily extend to Finnish Americans because when they have this index, they're looking at like the society as a whole and the different kind of parts of that social infrastructure that would help to create happiness. And so Finland and America are very different places with very different social infrastructures. You know, and if you look at the things that contribute to this happiness index, things like you know healthcare, things like um people having kind of a, a better work-life balance than we might have in the united states typically those kind of things expand to it so i don't think anybody's done a real study on happiness among finnish americans but it would actually be comparing kind of apples and oranges in a sense uh, Jonathan is commenting, uh, there continue to be Finnish hymns in the ongoing hymnals published by the Ev Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the remnant of the Suomi Synod uh, movement. That's a, that's a good comment. Thanks. Yes, and actually, I should say that, yeah, that there are people who are still singing them. Um, Jonathan, thank you for coming. Exciting. Um, but, but yeah, there's instances too where you'll have Finnish language hymn, hymn singing happen in the United States. So it is still a living tradition. It's one of those things, you know, again, there's ebbs and flows of it and there's different ways. Some people do it, some people don't. Kristen is asking about blueberry foraging or foraging in general as a Finnish American cultural practice. How about other foraging and um, she says her grandparents were Finnish from Kauhava, and they always wanted to go out and pick blueberries, mosquitoes and all. I would say, yeah, foraging is a very important practice that I would say definitely has continued in the areas where it's feasible. You know, living in the Upper Peninsula like I do, I, I'm descended from people who did forage, right? And it's a very important part of my thing. I've, because of the pandemic, I became very, um, addicted to foraging for mushrooms last year. And I've learned about a lot of different mushroom species and haven't died eating them yet. So, you know, I would say foraging is definitely an important cultural practice that people did. And that does exist among people in the regions where it's still feasible today. <clears throat> and so a lot of my friends in the upper Midwest, like that's what we talk about is, ooh, we got the blueberries started or oh, first strawberries. So I would say it's definitely important. And the next question is about Finnish halls. My mother remembers, Kevin is writing, my mother remembers her parents going to dances in Finn halls near Spencer, New York, where Finn halls common to other communities as well. Uh, she said there was a one man band who played accordion and two other instruments. And uh, this I know there is, there is a book about Finn halls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so Finn halls were extremely important to Finnish cultural continuation um, from the earliest days, and they were all across. You know, anytime you had a reasonable amount of Finns and they wanted to create a hall, they would do it. You know, and some of course had political orientations. Some of the halls were dedicated to um, more like the temperance movement. There were halls that were built for the knights and ladies of Kaliva, and so there were plenty of ways to create social groupings within the Finnish communities across the country, and plenty of things to do in those halls. And so dancing, I think, is a very important part of that legacy, the music and dance. And you know, I mean, there's a band called Finn Hall from Minneapolis that very much enacts that tradition. Um, Hewlett is commenting, uh, there are the traditional folk dances like Scotti, Sottis and Raatikkoon and so on. We all have heard Raatikkoon at Finfests. Uh, if you've been to Finfests, it's, it's, uh, it has kind of like been embraced by Finnish Americans, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kim is writing, after visiting my ancestral home in Seekainen, I learned a lot about how Swedish culture influenced the Finnish culture in that region, which we were kind of talking about in terms of the food items and, and everyday, everyday um, words. Since the Swedes ruled Finland for so long and basically did not allow Finns to submit documents in their native language and surely Finnish cultural traditions were discouraged. Do you see any blended Swedish-Finnish cultures? 
in uh, American fin as part of American Finnish culture. Yeah, absolutely. So again, that previous example of the language that you know came over that that's a clear one. Um, the use of a word like Laksvoda to describe something that you could describe using Finnish. Um, I know people in Finnish America who have like, like I have a cousin who um, his grandmother spoke Swedish like she was Finnish and she spoke Swedish. And so these kind of traditions could live side by side in Finland and America. Um, when, when we say that Finnish cultural traditions were discouraged, I mean, Finnish people were at the minimum 80% or Finnish speakers were at the minimum 80% of the population. And so even though they weren't the rulers of the country, you know, before the 1900s, basically, they, they had free reign to practice some of their things. Um, I would say the religious traditions were the parts that kind of got suppressed. And that was a lot earlier on, you know, it was during 1500s and before. And, you know, also the witch trials up into 1700s. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any, uh, this is Jean, are there any particular traditions from the Northwest? Is that, that, oh, go ahead. Is that the Northwest? Well, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm assuming that they mean the Pacific Northwest. There's some really great Finnish communities in the Pacific Northwest, if that's what you're talking about. Um, and so, you know, we have Finns around like Seattle, um, we have Finns in uh, like Astoria, Oregon and stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, I would say that each area has their own kind of traditions and their own sort of practices. And so um, when you have when you have them being kind of transplanting into these new places, some are moving to New York City, some are moving to like Astoria, some are moving to the UP, that culture that they're gonna practice is really, really gonna relate to the jobs that they do, to the new landscape they live in. And so, um, I mean, I haven't really studied the Northwestern traditions just because that's not where I'm from. But having visited, you know, I'm always kind of struck by the sort of fishermen's population that developed among Finnish Americans, for instance. And so that would create a whole body of folklore on their own. Logging was a big deal. And so, you know, occupational folklore would have been a different. Uh, CM Daniel is asking uh, you to comment on the Finnish language and its sustainability, as it is so lovely and unique. It is true, it's lovely and unique. So yeah. how are we maintaining it here? It's a safe language in Finland, so I'll just leave that part. But, you know, in the United States, um, it is something that requires kind of institutional support, I would say. Uh, it's difficult to maintain a language if it's not spoken in the home and if it's not something that is regular. Um, you know, I can speak Finnish, I'm not fully fluent in it, but not having been in Finland in quite a while because the pandemic, I mean, my Finnish switch really has to be turned on, like that motor has to be primed. There's things like Suomikoulu, you know, which are kind of weekend day schools for kids. There's the Salolampi camp in Minnesota. So there are institutional supports for it. And there's also universities across the country that teach Finnish to college age students and sometimes auditors. And so, um, you know, there are institutional supports for it, but it's difficult if you can't keep it as like a, a home language to really strengthen it and keep it going. I would like to add to that uh, because I've done some some work on the maintenance of Finnish here in the U.S. Uh, it's it's possible to pass the language to the second generation, but the third generation becomes really a problem. We had I'm just writing a paper about my grandson who was a fluent speaker of Finnish until he went to pre-kindergarten and then the switch to English how he understands Finnish still but uh, but uh, says only isolated words so that's that's pretty much what we have found that by the third generation the the immigrant languages they tend to tend to disappear uh, Kara is asking, do you know how the Finnish Americans adopted the pasty? That was the cultural connection with the Celts, Celts right? Yeah. So yeah, basically, um, you know, the people working in the mines together, they saw their Cornish neighbor eating something that looked interesting and smelled good and said, hey, what's that? You know, so it's, it's just like how Americans started eating pizza or Chinese food or, you know. And in a way, um, as, as Kara is saying, uh, my family says it had something to do with, with the good food for the copper mines. It's probably easy to transport as a, as a lunch uh, for... Uh, the stereotype that they would carry the warm ones inside their clothes and it would kind of keep them warm because mines are cold. They're like 42 degrees down there. Um, and then, you know, it would also, your body would keep it warm at the same time. And then you'd have something, hopefully body heat for lunch. 
<laughs> Barb is asking, uh, it seems that uh, a lot of the Finnish American traditions were started by the second generation. Do you think that new traditions will be developed by later generations? I believe so. Yeah. I mean, I think that there is a lot of interest among younger people in their Finnish heritage. And a lot of times, you know, we as elders, we kind of want to project what we want them to do, you know, please continue this tradition, but they have to do it on their own. And so it'll be interesting to see the things that younger people do with Finnish American culture, because it is theirs, like it is all of ours. And there might be some things that don't work for them that we do now. And there might be things that they can develop or even adapt from Finland that'll work for them in the future. Uh, Luis is uh, pointing out, my mother made a nine grain bread that was very dense and I have not found a recipe for that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, nine, that sounds, sounds wonderful. Um, Judith, uh, what about all the many religious factions among Finnish Americans and political factions? Are there anything spe specifically Finnish in this tradition? I would say with regard to that, um, Finnish people can be pretty action oriented. Maybe that's like a personality trait, right? And so I always kind of have joked that two Finns is an organization, three is a, is a schism. Um, because, you know, I mean, one of the things that Finnish people did in the United States was they did band together based on religious, political, different social issues, which is how halls and churches were created. And, you know, this very much respect it does very much reflected a kind of Finnish American perspective in everyday life. So yeah, I mean, definitely when you have the freedom to do that and you have kind of, hey, we're Finns, we think this thing, we're gonna go ahead and band together and do this thing. It's, it was a very common practice among Finnish American communities. Julie is asking, is there a difference between Finnish joulutorttu and the UP version? I find in Finland, the crusts tend to be flakier. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, Helia is writing for those of us Finns, Finnish American, who live in pockets where there are no other Finns around. Finnishness is still a thing for us, although not recognized necessarily in Finnish American stereotypes. So it's that's very true. Mm -hmm. Um, Kathy is writing, uh, egg coffee is associated with Nordic foods in America. Is this something that is or has been consumed in Finland? Not while I lived there, but... Yeah, I've heard of it, but nobody's offered it to me in Finland. So, in interesting, interesting uh, cultural thing, maybe very narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be launched, maybe it can be sold, like the sauna beer and the sauna makkara. Egg coffee. <laughs> I don't know if there's a market for it. Yeah, well, it clarifies it. So, like, if you break it up and the, it, it makes a really nice clarified cup of coffee. But I'm always scared of having eggs in my coffee. <laughs> David is is writing as a hobby winemaker. I was astounded to hear your reference to the Finnish wine tradition. Is there a story behind the development of wine in Finland? So I must, I must admit that I was being rather facetious about that. Um, one of the reasons that the St. Rojo story develops and kind of is funny is because it was people saying, oh, we have these great wines. So, so there is not a real wine um, industry per se in Finland. I was on Oland a couple of years ago and I did see a couple of vineyards. So there is some wine production, but it, it's not a very good area for it. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a pretty good liar. Um. <laughs> Uh, we have some finished traits by Helia, creativity and innovation, hardworking, uh, suggested by Janet. Um, uh, back, to, um, back to Lauren's question, uh, who are some famous Finns? Now, there is a book in Finnish, the 100 most famous Finns. So, um, right. Think, well, she actually revised her question, so it's more about fin Finnish American. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the ones that people always mention is Matt Damon, right? He's like an eighth Finnish American. Um, Jessica Lange, also very famous Finnish American. There's um, Thaina Elg, who was a um, who superstar in the 50s. Um, gosh, who else is there? I mean, there's lots of kind of famous Finnish Americans, I would say. Um, there is a there is a web page, a Wikipedia page. If you just okay. yeah. uh, Google famous Finnish Americans, there is there is a list. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, 
Wikipedia. Oh, the difference between Nisu and Pula? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, so Nisu, um, that's a pretty typical word for Pula in, in Finnish America, which is this um, cardamom flavored bread. And so um, it, it's kind of one of those words that came over here and we kept, but Pula is the word that's more commonly used in Finland today. And it comes, it's related to the Swedish word Pula. Um, I was actually watching a movie on Amazon Prime a couple of weeks ago, because a lot of times that is one of the words that people point out is we don't say that in Finland, but some people do. So I was watching this movie called Heavy Trip, which is about this heavy metal band up in like um, Tyvolkoski. And he asks this girl out and he says, do you want to go out for coffee? And she goes, yeah, and Nisu too. So and she actually used the term Nisu. So some little pockets in Finland still use it. And it's a word that actually relates like wheat or grain, I think. Yes. Uh, so um, Janet, uh, Carl is asking, when did bilingualism fade away in the Finnish American communities? Um, I think the, the consensus among linguists is that it pretty much all the, the immigrant communities that it fades away by the third generation, unless you do something really radical, like send send those third generation uh, Finnish Americans to Finland all the time and where they are in a more monolingual uh, situation. Um, there used to be publishing houses in Michigan, Massachusetts that printed Finnish language newspapers. You're thinking about Raivaya, I think, and um, and and uh, I think the. I'll, I'll let you address that, but it's it's a small population. Yeah, That's the problem. Yeah, for I agree. So it really is like the third generation, at least here in the Upper Peninsula, where it does kind of die out um, because there was more intermarriage, because people were kind of feeling like, you know, we need to move over to English. Um, a lot of immigrants of different cultures were told that your kids aren't going to succeed in America if they're not, you know, English speakers and if they're not doing that. And um, they were also kind of told that just kind of weird things like um, if, if your kid is learning a bunch of Finnish, they're not going to have room in their heads for English. That's simply not true. Like kids are great at learning languages. And so youth is really the most important time to do that. So yeah, it's that kind of third generation, it seems, where it passes out. But in other cases, I mean, if you're not surrounded by their friends and you don't have that local kind of institutional support for having Finnish being spoken, it could pass off a lot sooner. We are starting to run out of time, or we have actually run out of time already. So uh, we have some uh, some more questions here. Uh, if you, Hillary, if you would like to address some of them, and uh, a lot of these are responses for other people's comments. We have some more Finnish traits like grit, mm -hmm. and and so on, um, Finnish halls where, where, where there are Finnish halls. So you can kind of like, um, kind of like scroll down the chat so you can, you can yeah. see answers to- Well, so I'll give some quick answers that I know. Um, yes. Warren Tikkanen's Finnish Folk Tales tapes are archived at the Finnish American Heritage Center. They're also archived um, at the uh, Archives of Traditional Music at Indiana University. I don't believe either has been digitized so they wouldn't be um, available unless they got digitized. Um, is there a difference between Finnish and Finnish American meanings of Sisu? I haven't noticed any significant differences, I would say. I think that it seems to be a common idea that is still pretty strong. And, but I mean, the main thing is that individuals can kind of adjust Sisu to how they feel. And that other people, like if you're saying you have Sisu and you're doing something that clearly isn't displaying Sisu, the group will tell you. Um, there's Suome Savoidan Valmista Vain Maria Vina. That means in Finland, we can only make um, berry wine. So this is true. And again, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm such a good BSer. <laughs> sorry, I said that in a lecture. Um, so yeah, I already talked about the kind of world happiness index and how it is that that indexes. Nature is very important for Finns, hardworking. Um, yeah, alcoholism is, is an interesting thing, right? That I think a lot of people consider a part of the Finnish American experience. Um, I think one of the things that when people kind of mention populations that seem to have a propensity for that, one of the things that unites those people is that farming was introduced a lot later. So grain-based beverages were introduced a lot later, which I guess would have a biological intolerance, but I'm not really a geneticist or a biologist. So that's just me kind of talking out of what I've heard. Um, hi, Jennifer. So 
let's see, works for the University of Minnesota Extension, introduced community development initiatives in rural Minnesota, the towns with a high percentage of Finnish Americans have a high degree of citizen participation and success. Yes, that's that's true. It's I would agree with that. Um, okay. Mario is providing a recipe for the nine grain bread. So <laughs> it's on YouTube, evidently. So if, if you're interested, it's it's uh, down there if you scroll. Mario Kuklin mm -hmm. for the nine grain bread recipe. And Amanda Irwin is asking um, the organization that had the St. Orho talk like a couple weeks ago, they're Finnish American cultural activities. And so if you just um, look them up on YouTube, you'll go straight to their channel and they have all kinds of lecture videos. So, yeah. Okay, well, I, I think we need to stop here and thank you so much. We didn't get to all the questions, but some of these were definitely probably overlappingly uh, addressed by, by Hillary in, in the answers. And we I'm just gonna provide my email address if anybody, you know, that's that's what I was going to ask next. So that's so you can get in touch with her directly, and also look for that link on the FinFest USA website. But now um, I want to wish you all a very good month between now and and uh, April, last Saturday in April, when we have the music program, and then. It, it continues for the rest of this year. Thank you so much, Dr. Virtanen, and thank you for all the participants. Thank you for coming here, and and we'll keep those Finnish American traditions going. Mm -hmm. And Helena, before we go, thank you to everybody, and thank you to FinFest. And again, if you guys have questions, you can email me directly. Helena, will you take the chat and send it to me as a PDF? Because you can do that after after this ends, the chat will pop up. Yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Okay, bye everybody. Hey hey. Hey hey. Hey pa.